This is Newsroom. Hello and welcome to you from Johannesburg in South Africa. My name is Eben Janssen. This show is live and is broadcast from our studios in Auckland Park. We also stream live on YouTube as we speak. That's between 9 and 10 a.m. every morning with the entire show then available on our YouTube channel all of the time. Today we ask why South Africa ranks lowest in the latest World Economic Forum Global Report on Mathematics and Science Education. We go behind the monster that killed three people in Krikwistat and we get updates after evictions in Luanli in the Cape and the latest on the Raya Vaya bus strike that's affecting so many people here in Johannesburg. But first, let's start with our top stories. More than 800 people from Luanla informal settlement outside the Strand in Cape Town will for now avoid being evicted. The Transport Department has temporarily suspended the eviction from the land earmarked for road construction. Transport Minister Dipo Peters says the evictions are halted because of their concern for the affected families. Independent Electoral Commission Chair Pansit Lakula will appear in the Electoral Court this morning. She will have to formally respond to claims that she should be removed from her post. Newly appointed South African Test Captain Hashim Amla said it was time for him to take responsibility for the team and not concentrate solely on his own performance. Amla is the new Test Captain of the South African national cricket team. He's the fifth appointed Proteus captain since readmission after Graham Smith retired in March. The latest World Economic Forum Global Report on Information Technology suggests that South Africa's mathematics and science education is ranked as the worst in the world. According to the report, the quality of the country's math and science education is at the bottom of 146 other countries, but the Education Department has rejected these findings and says the report did not base its research on any actual tests or assessments done by pupils. Now, to talk to, this about, to, talk to us about this and find a possible solution is the communications manager from Education Support Group, EduSciMat, Kaliswa Korba. Good morning to you, my dear. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Ewan. That was a mouthful, wasn't it? And, 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 and the doomsayers would say, oh God, we told you so, it's really that bad. But just give us, give us your insights. You work in this field and you work with the education department. Yes, no, definitely. Look, even we're not surprised by the report. I mean, that's why companies like us exist in, in, in South Africa to try and remedy these issues as far as maths and science is concerned. I mean, Edu Simon is in the space of education, is focusing in maths and science. And uh, whether we are the last in the country, look, the department has rejected and they're saying, look, what are they basing it on? I mean, if you look at the, the report itself, they're saying Singapore is number one. You look at the population in Singapore and you look at the technology Singapore has. I mean, it's, it's, it's ranked the second in, in the world as far as technology, excuse me, the first in the world as far as technology is concerned. And if if you look at how technology enhances the teaching in a classroom, I mean, if we had interactive screens as much as uh, Singapore does in, 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 in all our classes, yeah. it would take less time for the teachers to prepare a lesson. You know, we would not have a teacher writing for, within a 45 minutes in a classroom. Yeah. Instead of a teacher writing out a lesson in the first 10 minutes and then taking the rest of the time to deploy the solution or, or the lesson rather, they would take less time preparing for a lesson. So the research is really based on what is it that we have an advantage that Singapore has versus what South Africa has in terms of re as far as resources are concerned, specifically in IT, is what I think the research is actually based on. The report is damning, yes, but it's not like here in South Africa nothing is being done to, to try and affect change. Tell us about what you guys are doing and, and tell us about the success stories that you've had in places like the Free State and so yeah. forth. No, definitely. Look, we're looking at the, the, the challenge where we're saying when we need to make a difference, we need to look at the, what the school environment is. And if you're going to make a difference in a school environment, you need to look at the three, what we call the 3D impact, yeah. which is the learner, the teacher, and the environment itself. And that's what Edu Simon is focusing on. We're focusing on teacher development, we're focusing on learner grasping the whatever concept that has been introduced in the maths and obviously the environment itself. So what we've done is we've introduced uh, manipulatives, we've introduced ICT, we've introduced concepts where a simulation is shown. So if you look at a child that's being taught in a foundation phase numbers and you're yeah. saying one plus one is two or, or three minus five, you actually take real life simulation and you actually let the child look at the actual 
lifetime uh, concept of where they would use this yeah. and making mathematics fun in such a way that they are able to relate it to the day to day. I mean, mathematics is something that you use on a daily basis. Yeah. And the sooner we get that concept right to say it's not a taboo, it is a fun subject that children should made to love in a classroom. Yeah. And that's what would change, obviously, it's, the it's results. It's about putting it into practice and making it real, I suppose. Definitely, definitely. In South Africa, we always look at matric pass rate as, mm -hmm. the, as the be all and end all of it. And, mm -hmm. and, and because the 30% is seen as so low, this is always being bashed as one of the reasons why we're we battling. But this isn't the case. And, 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 and tell us your thoughts on this and, and how that sh can and should change. Look, I believe that we need to change it from, from, from bottom up. I, I really believe in a, in, in, in a situation where we need to look at it from, from, from bottom up in a sense that, I mean, you look at uh, metric, um, if, for them to be in metric and you look at the maths and science re 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 results, what is it that was done when they were in foundation to make sure that when they get to grade 10, before they can choose maths and science as a subject that they enjoy, what, was, what, what interventions were done to make sure that they actually get to enjoy maths and science as a subject. Yeah. And that's why when you get to matric, you find that people just write an exam just to go through it. Yeah. But, and with all the dynamics that have has happened, we don't really focus on making sure that the children grasp and understand what is it that they're taught in classrooms. Instead, we just go through it and, I mean, we look at the teacher development as well. From foundation phase, you find a teacher that is actually just focused on all the subjects. Yeah. You don't get a teacher that is actually focused on maths or on science or whatever the case might be. So you don't find specialists within mathematics within our school fields. So when they get to matric, they were taught by somebody that's just uh, a, a teacher that just goes through a lesson for the sake of that particular time limit that they've been given. And with the resources that they, they don't have in the classroom, it's very difficult for them when they get to matric to understand it and make it a, a subject that they actually enjoy. Therefore, it'll impact the results, whether we like it or not. Other things that impact results. What about yeah. external factors, discipline in schools? Yeah. Uh, what about things like uh, corruption within the schooling yeah. system? Uh, we've had issues with principals and embezzling money and so forth. And then the department's responsibility. How does all of that change? You see, that's where the environment plays a critical. I've mentioned in previously that you look at the learner, you look at the teacher development, and you look at environment. See, if you make an environment, a conducive environment for a child to be able to want to stay in there. I mean, we look at, we just conducted a survey within the, 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 the results that, I mean, obviously, that the solution that we've deployed, a uh, maths lab in, in, in the schools, where we actually say it makes maths interesting. Therefore, a classroom is colorful. The ambience is colorful. Yeah. You've got manipulatives in there. Therefore, a child will actually want to stay in a classroom to learn more about this particular subject. So an environment plays a very critical role and I do believe that the education system is really trying so hard to actually make this happen. And it's not going to happen overnight Eben. I mean, we've started in the free state and we, you know, we're talking to Northwest, we're talking to KZN and we're saying that as, as Free State was a pilot, it's one but of, of the nine provinces we have in the countries. And we've seen the improvement, yeah. you know, in terms of what we've deployed in the solution um, in, in the province. So we're saying, let it start in Free State, but let it go to all the other countries, to other uh, provinces course. as well. And obviously that'll make a difference in, in the country as a whole. Well, we've seen the success you guys have had in the Free State with the results right up there uh, this time around. So you're doing a super job, and let's hope it goes around the country. Edu Saimat, uh, Communications Manager, uh, Koliswa Koba, thank you for joining us today. It's a great uh, pleasure. Worrying story that is, of course, the latest World Economic uh, Forum Global Report on Information Technology suggests earlier this week that South Africa's mathematics and science education is ranked as the worst in the world. Let's just take a look at one of our top stories now. Opposition parties in the northwest say the removal of the Lekwatemani municipal manager Andrew Makuapane was unprocedural. Both the DA and the EFF maintains that only a council resolution can suspend him. But the provincial government has denied the suspension. This comes in the wake of a water contamination crisis in that area. High level government intervention. Service delivery concerns in the area high on the agenda. The area rocked by water contamination crisis which saw three infants dying. Now opposition parties allege proper procedures were not followed when suspending the local municipal manager. The Premier of the Northwest Province or any other Premier in South Africa for that matter, including the MECs, do not have powers to suspend municipal managers. 
Well, what we've seen here is uh, typical what's happening within the ANC. They needed a scapegoat for the deaths of the three, three babies. Government denies the suspension, saying a decision will be communicated in council. The only authority that can suspend the municipal manager is the and local municipality, but we will impress on them as the provincial government because we are responsible for investigations that the municipal manager must be suspended. Scores of people sought medical attention after water in the area was contaminated. The town was left without water last week. People are now being urged to boil water before drinking. Selo Tatai, SABC News, Mahigeng. The Commission of Inquiry into the multi-billion rand arms deal in Pretoria has been postponed until Thursday. Originally, the commission chaired by Judge Willie Siriti was scheduled to resume on Monday with former government uh, ministers and others set to testify. President Jacob Zuma appointed the commission in September 2011 after the Western Cape High Court uh, was asked in 2009 to appoint an independent judicial inquiry into alleged corruption in the arms deal. Now, the SABC's uh, man, Njanji Chaki, is in the studio to give us the latest. Good morning, Njanji. Thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. This thing is stretching out and becoming a little bit more uh, uh, vague, if, 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 if that is the right. We'll just update us on, on when decision makers uh, in this case will take center stage and how this, uh, this case will proceed. Yeah, we've seen delay after delay since the commission started. As we know that they were dealing with the first phase of the commission, which was to look at the rationale for acquiring this equipment uh, for the yeah. South African National Defense Force. What was supposed to happen last week was to see the top government ministers coming through to testify. I'm talking here about people like uh, Ronnie Castles, who mm. is a former minister, uh, the former defense minister, Lisiwa Likota, uh, Jayan Ranaidu, who was the chief negotiator, yeah. and then ultimately we were going to see people like Trevor Manuel yeah. and finally the former president Thabo Mbeki. There's been a delay, and the commission only resumes tomorrow with a testimony by Pierre Stein. And then on Friday, we have one of the five big guns, Ronnie Castles, taking the stand. There, were, there was some disappointment with uh, the, the appearance of, of Alec Irwin. Yeah. Uh, are we likely to see any changes this time around? It, it would be interesting to see if people like Musiwa Lukota will sort of tow the so-called ANC or government line since he's no longer a member yeah. of the African National Congress. He was a uh, defense minister then and now he is with another party. It would be interesting to see if he will to uh, the, the, the government line or if he will be, yeah. he'll spill the beans, if he'll say something else. Since the commission started, we, we haven't seen a real probe into the corruption side of it. We've seen to why these arms were needed and so forth. Are we likely to start seeing fireworks soon now that we're getting into this phase of the commission? Uh, the so-called arms deal critics did try to put some uh, petrol into the fire mm. uh, with the cross-examination. Here I'm talking about people like Andrew Feinstein, uh, Henny Van Feeren, uh, those people trying to to tell the commission, hey, guys, let's get to the point. You know, we know uh, there was a first investigation that took place. What we need to do here is to get to the point who uh, uh, took bribes and then what will be happening to those people. Uh, uh, as you know, that the President Zuma had to extend the commission by another 12 months, meaning they have until uh, November. Uh, of this year. It would be interesting mm. to see how, will, how things will pan out going forward. Uh, President Zuma is, is, is in this second term. Are we likely to see more delays, yeah. you know, the commission dragging on? So those are the people, uh, the questions that people are really asking out on the streets. Uh, what, what about uh, someone like a key whistleblower in this case, uh, Patricia DeLille? Uh, do you have any idea when someone like that will be taken to, this, taken to the stand and, and what kind of explosive kind of evidence uh, would we then expect from her? Yeah, we are all waiting for the evidence for people like uh, Patricia DeLille and uh, other whistleblowers. Um, those people have been allocated uh, uh, the second phase of the commission. Mm -hmm. uh, the testimony of the five top uh, uh, government officials is wrapping up uh, the first phase of the commission and uh, it will now um, uh, go into the second phase where we are likely to see uh, uh, people like 
Patricia <laughs> Delille and others. You broke the chair then, Janji. <laughs> that's, that's a good thing you're on yeah. a diet. I wanted yes. to ask you finally before we go on. Yes. This commission, it, there's been delays and it's, it's been a kind of slow start to it, the first phase of it, as you spoke about. Tell me about whether this commission, in a way, is, is battling credibility for credibility now. A lot of questions have been raised about the cred credibility of the commission. Um, uh, because of these delays, we saw some of the top uh, uh, lawyers involved in that commission or the commissioners uh, resigning uh, when this commission was uh, getting off the ground. So from the word go, uh, the commission starting, there were already uh, serious questions around its credibility and all that. Njanji, thank you very much. We're going to have to release you uh, and replace our chair. <laughs> Thanks for joining us this morning. That's uh, okay. uh, Njanji Chaki, our reporter who's dealing with the arms deal and who keep, will keep, us, well, keep you up to date as to how things develop towards the end of the, the rest of the week. Uh, of course, tomorrow the commission, uh, well, into the multi-million rand arms deal will resume in Pretoria. Thanks, Njanji. Thank you. Now let's take a quick look at some of the front pages around the world this morning in the United States, the New York Post reporting on the swap of five Guantanamo detainees this week for U.S. soldier Bo Bergdahl. What began as an uplifting tale of a rescued hero has become a political headache for President Barack Obama with questions rising from all angles. The International New York Times reflects on the 25 years after the Tiananmen Square massacre while in the United Kingdom, the independent focusing on the conflict in Syria. Yes, 25 years ago this week, one of the world's most infamous demonstrations was taking place in Beijing. After weeks of peaceful protests in Tiananmen Square, China's People's Liberation Army marched on its own people as authorities responded on the 4th of June 1989 with a bloody and a ruthless massacre of hundreds. We remember that day in our YouTube clip of the day. The atmosphere here is edgy. Even with permits and government minders, our filming is constantly interrupted. Soldiers, policemen, men in plain clothes all demand our papers. The authorities here are afraid of cameras. They know their power. They have hundreds of them trained on Tiananmen Square. Their cameras. Cameras in other hands are considered dangerous and with good reason. This place can be a powder keg. On a June night in 1989, Tiananmen Square was a war zone. The People's Liberation Army fought its way into Beijing from four directions with orders to converge on the square. Armed citizens and students faced armored personnel carriers, tanks, and soldiers armed with semi automatic weapons. One of the darkest days in the history of this planet. Don't ever forget, we are Earth, we are together, we are one. Let's take a look at your thoughts on social media. Of course, we love interacting with you, we love to hear your views, put up your pictures at SABC Newsroom. That's where you can put it up and we'll interact with it. Uh, We'll have a bit of fun with it. If it's really good, we'll put it up. Let's have a look at some of today's comments. Princess Boiti says it's not all Angie's fault, though, although she does appear to be making things worse. Hashtag essay education. That was, of course, our previous discussion. Mark says the future appears to be brighter for the Philippines, site of the World Economic Forum on East Asia in May. Well, are you suggesting corruption on the list, Mark? That would be... Tabo says, apparently we are the worst place to learn maths and science. So disturbing. This WF report on education is quite damning. Bulalani says that Daniel Sot, the government may question WF methodology in condemning SS education outcomes, but clearly something is acutely amiss. Sobering thought there. And Janita Katri says, if you can't add or multiply, you will probably reject the report. Yeah, that's a little bit of humor. Uh, from some of our some of our users and some of those of you that are interacting with us on our Facebook page. All of the stories and more on our Facebook page. Of course, this show is live right now. We're streaming live. We'll be back after a short break.
Africa is symbolized by these magnificent trees. The Sunland Big Baobab is carbon dated to be around 1,600 years old. When baobabs become a thousand years old, they begin to hollow inside. In the Big Baobab, this has resulted in the world famous Baobab tree bar. That's Kaleidoscope, Sundays, 5.30 p.m. on SABC News. Watching newsroom on SABC News. Sentencing proceedings continue in the trial of the 17-year-old boy found guilty of killing the Steenkamp family on their farm near Grukostad on Good Friday in 2012. The teenager was found guilty on three counts of murder. Dion, his wife Cristal, and their 14-year-old daughter Martella were shot dead in cold blood. Martella was also raped. Now, the man who has been following this trial from day one and who's also written a book on it is SABC reporter Jacques Stenkamp, who joins us in studio this morning. Good morning, Jacques. Thanks morning, for joining Eva. us. Thanks. It's been now quite a, a, a sort of drawn-out story a little bit, but you've been intimately involved with it from, the, from the beginning. Just give me your views on it. Yeah, basically, um, on the 6th of April, the story broke that night. I got the news. I, I tweeted about it. And since then, I basically have been following the case. I've been traveling around the country after the, the boy, prior to the trial commencing. Um, yeah, from East London to Bethlehem to Jakobsdal, everywhere, because um, obviously he was a prime suspect. Yeah. Um, and we had to know more about this guy. Um, yeah, so, I mean, in the last two years, I've spent about five months um, in Kimberley and Krikostad just reporting on this, meeting people, um, investigating the story, basically, for the newspapers before I joined on the SABC. And, and the book, tell us about the book and how you came about this. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of those stories that it's, it's so gripping, but someone was bound to write a book, and why not me? Um, so I basically I pitched the idea, and I wrote the book. It was quite a time-consuming process, yeah. but I, th I think uh, I wrote the book from my perspective, so people can see how investigative journalists goes about yeah. doing the stories and stuff, and what exactly happened, how uh, the interviews I had of people, the discussions I had of people, I could tell so much more about what was occurring. So it was very important, um, but I think people will enjoy the book, therefore, yeah. It's a terrible story, this uh before, I, before we get to the graphic details of it, I want to talk about the effect that it's had uh, on communities and the community there. It seems like people are very polarized. Some, some people, especially in the Krikostad area, it seems they're well supporting the young man, while everywhere else people are sort of against the, uh, the boy. Tell us about the latest around that. It seems there's a standoff in the Afrikaans community almost a little bit. No, it is indeed. It's, it's a very small community. I mean, it's a bunch of farmers. So, and, and the, the Stenkamp family was a very prominent family in, yeah. in the community. And therefore, there's still, still remnants of the family living, like, like distant cousins and stuff like that living there. And a lot of the people are still um, supporting the boy, believing that he's innocent, although he was found guilty on the 27th of March. So and other people believed it was him. So there's a lot of friction between the community because some people, if, I mean, if, if you go there and you'll say that he's guilty to the wrong person, they might get angry with you, upset with you. Yeah. So it's a lot of friction. But I mean, I think it was difficult for everybody to believe that this 15-year-old boy could commit this, this murder this, so, so brutally. Yeah, of course, we've got, uh, this is your book, uh, the, the, cover, yeah. the, the crime that shook South Africa uh, very much so. What's your, what's your take on, on those people who still say now that they believe the boy is innocent? Oh, well, he was found guilty, like I said, mentioned earlier, in the court. And if you, especially if you read the book, a lot, a lot of the court case was verbatim. So yeah. you, you, can, you can see that um, the evidence against him was overwhelming, although it was circumstantial evidence. But even in the boy's testimony, he chose to testify. Yeah. And by testifying, basically, I mean, he dug his own hole because you, could, you, you couldn't explain away what, he had, what had occurred. Yeah. And some of the things were so, so far-fetched. For example, he said that uh, he was hiding in the barn for like 10 minutes. Then he went into the house, he found Martella, who was still alive, bleeding in his arms, fell over, and he just left her there. He went into a bedroom, uh, put a place, replaced his bloody shirt with a new shirt, yeah. left the house, and he heard more shots. And according to his time frame, the murders would have occurred about, and the, the time from, from when they heard the first shot till arriving at the police station would have been taken about 30 minutes. Yeah. But he only had 13 minutes to do that in because the police, the, the, the Christelle Stenkamp sent an SMS to his sister at 18.34 and he arrived at the police station at 18.47. So it was 13 minutes yeah. 
So his, his time frame was wrong. The time frames don't, don't, I don't mean, match up. Yeah, the judge questioned him about the way, uh, why he didn't like, perform CPR or even looked why any of the victims were still alive. He, his story depends then on this being what we call in South Africa a far murder and that plays it, itself plays out in a certain way. It does. I mean, when I initially, the, 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 when I first heard about the story, it was from a right-wing organization. The guy said there was a farm murder. He played the race court saying it's a black and white farm murder. Yeah. And they went crazy about this. But then later, you know, the truth came out. And, you know, it, it, it wasn't that at all. This was totally different than anything else. It was a young boy that, that killed three people he knew. Tell me about the boy. Apparently, he's quite a charming manipulator of people. Yeah, well, I mean, he, he, he's, he's still trying to convince people that he's innocent. Obviously, after the murders, he didn't, he didn't, like, sit, uh, didn't do anything wrong again. So he, he basically, yeah, everybody believes in his innocence because he's yeah. maintaining, that, that, maintaining that he's innocent. And he's telling them that he's innocent. He's, he's crying in the arms of certain people behind the scenes, yeah. you know, and, try, and gaining their support. So obviously, these people are so close to him, but they can't see the truth. Yeah. And therefore, he's manipulating them. Well, in, in another high-profile case here in South Africa, we saw the Oscar trial where Oscar was in tears and uh, throughout the trial almost and, and at times really looked remorseful and so forth. Was that the case with this young man? Not at all. I mean, I was at the Oscar case as well and Oscar was crying and he showed remorse. This boy never showed any remorse. Um, he showed a lot of emotion, but he, he was agitated and irritated at times. But the only time I really saw him cry was at the memorial service a couple of days after the murders and when he was, when he, when he was told he had to stay in jail for 10 days after yeah. he, he did his bail application. Yeah. Well, Jacques, uh, it's a riveting book that you've written, and this is a story that I'm sure people will be interested in uh, in years to come, and, and sentencing proceedings are still ahead of us. Thank you for joining sure. us. Thank you. That's uh, our SABC reporter, Jacques Stenkamp, who wrote the book you see on screen there, The Chikwestat Murders, about a young man that killed three people, and it shook an entire community. Now, of course, in South Africa, top story, Hashim Amla is the new test captain of the South African national cricket team. Amla becomes the first appointed Proteus captain since readmission after Graham Smith retired in March. Enter the new captain. Consistently in the top 10 in the batting rankings, the only South African with the triple century to his name and certainly the best beard in the game, Amla is a global cricketing icon. The composed, soft-spoken batsman was a faithful servant under Smith for the past 10 years and one who declined the captaincy of the one-day side when Smith stepped down in 2011. But now he believes he is ready to lead South Africa's most accomplished squad. Throughout the years, I've, I've concentrated mainly on my batting. I've tried to become the best batsman possible and hopefully I can still get better. Um, but now I, I, you know, I do feel it's time to, to kind of act, to kind of contribute in a team environment. And I'm really glad and, and humbled uh, at this appointment. Amla, only the second black South African after Ashwell Prince to lead the Proteas, will get his first taste as test skipper in next month's two-match series in Sri Lanka. Amla will have two new caps to manage on tour. The selectors have included Cobra's off-spinner Dane Pitt and specialist batsman Stian Vazale in the Proteas test setup. Samantha Mari, SABC News, Johannesburg. Well, it's one of those, it's a one story that's got a lot of traction on social media. Let's take a look at what's been happening on our Facebook page. Of course, pre-sentencing procedures will continue in the case of the seven-year-old minor we just had a discussion with who was found guilty of killing three members of his family. Another story uh, there says the Reserve Bank is worried about the possibility of another poor economic performance. And we have a video clip of the newly appointed Proteus captain, Hashim Amla there, showing the day he made the highest score by a South African cricketer. That, of course, was 311 all out, or 311 not out. Uh, Hashim Amla made history as he became the first South African to score a triple century during a stunning day with a bat against England at the Oval in 2012. Amla broke several records on that day, uh, four at the Oval, most notably when he surpassed teammate A.B. de Villiers' 278 not out, the previous highest test innings for a South African, and then reached 300 shortly before T. Let's take a look at how he did it. Book innings, capping it off with his first ever triple century. Hashim Amla, well played. Enjoy this moment. Crowd getting deserved applause. Hashim Amla, the first South African to get 300 in a test match. Your country salutes you. Your teammates salute you. Declaring with a first innings lead of two.
Yeah, that is our new cricket captain, Hashim Amla, and uh, may he have lots of success as he's had as a batsman uh, all around the world. We're going to take a short break. More live crossings after this. Ninety-nine percent Zulu has returned to the Lurik Theatre in Gold Reef City in Johannesburg this weekend. Now do the Madeba Chai. The Madeba Chai. Eh, 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 this guy doesn't know how to do the Madeba Chai. What? Sarah Dupree is bringing his celebrity impersonations to Johannesburg. Audiences will be treated to nights of glitz and glamour and Sher, Lady Gaga, Tina Turner and more impersonations. That's Afro Showbiz News, Saturdays, 7.30pm on SABC News. Welcome back. This is Newsroom. Let's just take a quick look at our top stories. More than 800 people from Luan, an informal settlement outside the Strand in Cape Town, will for now avoid being evicted. The Transport Department has temporarily suspended the eviction from the land earmarked for road construction. Transport Minister Deco Peters says the evictions are halted because of their concern for the affected families. Independent Electoral Commission Chair Pansy Takula will appear in the Electoral Court this morning. She will have to formally respond to claims that she should be removed from her post. Five opposition parties took Takula to court saying her conduct during a deal to lease the IC headquarters indicates that she's not fit to run the country's elections. Newly appointed South African Test Captain Hashim Amla said it was time for him to take responsibility for the team and not concentrate solely on his own performance. Amla is the new Test Captain of the South African national cricket team. He is the fifth appointed Proteus Captain since readmission after Graham Smith retired in March. Human Settlements Minister Lindiwe Sisulu will today visit the community of Luanle outside the Strand in the Western Cape. Cecilia has criticized their eviction, saying the city of Cape Town and Sanral should have handled it better. Last night, Transport Minister Dipo Peters also visited the area and addressed affected community members. Affected community members packed the local community hall, hoping to find a solution from government. Tempers fled when they spotted a man suspected of having been part of the evictions. But calm was quickly restored. Minister Dipua Peters called on the community to work with government. In South Africa, we need to build more than 750,000 kilometers of road. And this piece is also included in that 750,000 kilometers. So we're saying today we are here to actually on behalf of Sandran and on behalf of ourselves as a government, apologize to these people, but also we expect them to work together with government to make sure that we adhere to the decisions that we make. We adhere to the areas that have been demarcated for human settlement. Peters, however, says they are concerned with the humanitarian situation. We have already said to Sandran and the sheriff to stop the evictions because we believe that this is actually wrong time. It is winter, it is cold, it is windy, it's wet all over here in the Western Cape. Three local community halls have been made available to accommodate those affected. More than 800 people were evicted from over 220 sheikhs. Well, SABC reporter Nomoweto Solwandle joins us from Luandle in the Strand in the Western Cape. Good morning, Nomoweto. Thanks for joining us. Can you give us the latest there, Nomoweto? Very good morning to you, Evan.
Well, Yevon, at the moment, we are actually at one of the community halls where the people that were evicted yesterday and Monday spent their first night. And really, Yevon, the mood is very somber down here as people don't know what the future holds for them. We actually took a drive this morning when we arrived here to the informal settlement where people were evicted from. And it was a very quiet and sort of like different mood from what we saw yesterday because yesterday, I mean, we literally drove into rubber bullets and stun grenades, the people resisting. People were literally crying, trying to stop the authorities from destroying their shacks. But there seems to be a lot of confusion, Urban, in this story where nobody wants to take responsibility about the evictions. I mean, Sanral says this is their own land. It's privately owned. But the city as well says if it's your um, land and it's privately owned, then you need to take care of it. You need to make sure that people do not invade this land. And what the city is now saying is that Sanral has failed to do that and now they're shifting the blame to the city. The city says it has no man mandate or it doesn't have a right to actually control what happens in privately owned land. But, but like I said, Eben, we are now at this community hall where people spent their first night. Over 100 people slept at this specific um, hall from last night. But to tell us more about how people feel about the whole situation, we are now joined by a young mother, Mukhumulet, who spent her first night. Thank you for joining us, Mukhu. Just, Kasta Lele Sisibana, Bekunja Anula Lapizor. Bekufunga Kulu, Kia Banda, Inda Bokala, Sileli Nabantwana, Siblawa Yungele, Apa, Abantwana Betu, Abana Nempatha Zongiba, Gwobangela Tasha Besile Konga Mapolis, and then Daute Wawela Pansum Tanami, Brukwebe Ngebile Wawele Takeni, Kia Ngokukungo Kaka Ngebanga Wa Brukwe, and Kia Banda Ngeti Mvula Papandu. Sisi, Abantu ba ninsi izolo bebe kala besi tabantu baktela noko bake baba nikenje insu kwe zimbalo bana bachale zinzin zabo. Ugu ziva njani wenu kubona kwa kujojo belako li chajala li suzoro. Bogu psu mkakulu ngwa baba bendinga azaponi zao yakono. Bogu psu mkakulu ngwa baba ela jojo mbebe ndiltenge nge mali, ndiltenge nge mali nje na lo mali anayo anpangeli umye nakapangeli kunja lo nje kwa ngoku abanye betu abanye betu baba nji. Imi sebe nzizo pela asa privacy <laughs> Well, that was more She's a young mother who spent her first night here yesterday explaining how difficult it is to live under these conditions. She says she didn't have much in her shack, but having to live here with all these people, there's no privacy. It's cold. They have young children, and, and they just don't know um, what they're going to do. She says her husband was one of the people that were arrested yesterday, and he, she's scared that he might even lose his job. They don't have money. Really, the future is very uncertain for these people that are staying here, Eben. Thank you very much. No more to, no more to Solwandle, giving us an update there after the evictions at Luwandle, Luwandle in the Western Cape. She'll keep you updated as to how that story develops uh, for the rest of the day on this very platform. Now, here in Johannesburg, the Royal Bar bus drivers embarked on an illegal strike yesterday. The bus servicing uh, the T1 route along the Soweto Highway and feeders from Naledi, Protea Glen, Jababu, Mfolo and Eldorado Park were among the services affected, causing great consternation. So either Piotrans, the company that manages the operations of Ravai and the South African Municipal Workers Union, Samu, were available to give reasons for the strike. It's the second time that the strike has affected the service. In April, the bus drivers embarked on a strike, leaving commuters around Johannesburg stranded for almost a week. Now, for the latest, we are joined by Dumisan Mtambo, who is the General Manager, Strategy and Transformation at Power Trans. Good morning to you, sir. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. And good morning to your, uh, your viewers. Just give us a little update on what's the latest with the strike and how it's affecting people's lives. Okay. Firstly, I would like to apologize to our commuters. You know, we, we seem to be apologizing quite a lot these days. Um, we are apologizing for any inconvenience that they've suffered. Unfortunately, we found ourselves uh, being involved in the strike yesterday 
we were not prepared because we we engage with the uh, with the drivers and in, in, in terms of whatever their demands were, we thought we responded accordingly. But yeah. unfortunately, then we found ourselves in that situation yesterday. What, what do you right. say to people, though, that, that are, are, are depend on the bus service, they budget for the bus service, uh, they buy weeklies and monthly tickets? Uh, are you going to reimburse them for the days that they couldn't use the bus? Are they going to be allowed to, to ride for free on other days? How do you reimburse them for the cost that they incur? As the bus operating company, we don't deal with the fares. It's the city that deals with the fares. Unfortunately, on that score, we can't you know, say that this is how we're going to assist them. But what we've done in terms of the agreements yesterday is to make sure that we're then going to take the full month to make sure that we try and iron out all the issues that have been cropping up, cropping up because it is apparent that the issue is the issue of the money, irrespective of issues that they try and raise. So this is how as a company will try and do to say for the entire month we are going to engage as on the 19th we will then report on the 19th of June and then on the 4th of July as well we will then report on the progress in terms of how far to try and make sure that we no longer you know yeah. find ourselves in these situations again. This was an illegal strike why and then also tell us how much money or what is the change that the drivers would want to see you know if you've noticed in uh, in the past is that we belong to Sabek, the bargaining council and unfortunately our drivers belong to a union that is not a part of Sabak. so every time when the negotiations are completed in terms of uh, the salaries then you find that they have a problem in terms of whatever that was agreed yeah. at SAPEC, then we will have these wildcat strikes. So there are, in terms of uh, salaries, we cannot negotiate yeah. on those issues. But what they were demanding is that there were promises that were made in 29 and in 2010. And we, we're now going to sit down as a team and investigate in terms of those promises because as Pyrotrans at that time, yeah. we were not running the company. And, and, and what's your message finally to the commuters who are, who are desperate to use these services and who pay and who themselves are losing money? Like I said, that we, we, we apologize and we hope that the steps that we've taken from now to say, you know, we're going to make sure that the drivers understand what does it mean, collective agreement, yeah. what does it mean when you say uh, you've signed a contract and you then need to adhere to your contract. Maybe if we, instead of punishing them, we then need to take them through and, you know, sort of teach them in terms of the impact that yeah. the, the, the commuters uh, suffer in terms of their action. Hopefully, if we all then understand that whatever problems that we are having, not only does it affect us, but it affects the commuters in a, a severe manner. And hoping from there, you know, we can do better and, have no, and no longer have these rights. Well, all the commuters are waiting with bated breath. We hope this is sorted out soon. Thank you for joining us Thank this you. morning. Right. The Raya Via bus strike, while they embarked on an illegal strike in Johannesburg, affecting thousands of thousands of people traveling, uh, well, home and to work, both in the morning and in the evening, caused a lot of consternation for people who wanted to work. Finally, last month, we brought you the story of Kurs van der Scheef, a father with a 30-year-old son who suffers from cerebral palsy and a school that brings much light to his life. Katrine Milan has more on this. Oh, thank you, Eben. Yes, we brought you the story of the Lizito School that looks after the physical and mentally challenged in Johannesburg and the Lizito Land Festival that helps out by raising funds for the school. Now, this festival was last month, and now joining us for an update on the story is Diolinda Molina, the Lizito School principal, and Sergio Aquino, first vice chairman from the Lizito Executive Committee. Guys, welcome to the show. Thank you for thank you. inviting us. I want to start off with the school. Give us a bit more of a background. What exactly do you do? Go ahead. Okay. Hi, good morning. Uh, the school started uh, 30 years ago, and we have grown into a school of 70 learners at the moment. And we offer uh, an adapt curriculum as well as physio, speech, occupational, and hydrotherapy. Over the years, it's been 30 years, how has the school grown, developed, and the involvement of the festival, how has that helped you guys? Well, as Diori said, we, 
the, the school was started 35 years ago. And uh, it was the original founders decided to, the only way to raise, what to run the school was to raise money for the school. So we started with a festival, the, the Lusito Land Festival. And that really started as one day, which was on a Sunday. And uh, it has since grown into an 11 day event. And uh, so initially it was a couple of hundred people on the Sunday. And now we are receiving, we get about over 85 to 90,000 people at the festival. And it was originally formed because we wanted to raise money for the school. And so our total income for the school comes from the festival itself. So we're very reliant and uh, require the festival to survive as a school. We don't get subsidies, but we rely on the festival as, as the main income generator to run the school. Now, I understand um, before the festival this year, you said you were hoping it's going to be a bumper festival, bumper funds raised. So what were the funds raised? Well, we're we currently finalizing the financials at this point. But the festival is very reliant on the weather, and we thank God we had very good weather this year. So we had a very good year. We had a good, good turnout of, of people. And uh, I mean, I'll take this opportunity to thank our loyal you know, people that come to, to support the festival every year because we've got a generally a, a very loyal following. And it's very well received in the community. So um, we had a very good year, and we're very pleased. And we are currently working on some fantastic uh, changes to the festival next year uh, with new ideas and new themes. So we're very excited about uh, in the improvements that we'll be developing and working on for next year. Let us in more on the lives of these children that you deal with every day. What are the challenges that they face? Yes, um, the challenges that they face is mostly communication and we try to enlighten their lives and their routine, the daily routine. Uh, with extracurricular activities such as uh, active kids, pottery classes, baking classes. And um, as I also said, that we have the therapists that together with the teachers and the parents, they try to run the program spe specialized and individual for each learner. I see here the photos of the pottery classes and I see their swimming classes as well. What's it like working with these children every day? Well, it's, it's a challenge, as you mentioned, and that is a, we have to be very creative and try to do the best to get the best out of them and to enhance their life and to, get the, to reach the maximum potential. What is mostly needed by the school? With the funds that you just raised, how will those funds now also be used exactly in the school this year? Well, the funds will generally go to the running to cover the overheads of the school and also for, for the various improvements of the school of the, in terms of uh, you know, infrastructure improvements. Uh, and we put some money aside for the rainy day. And fortunately, as a school, we've, we've managed to, over the years, generate a surplus in the festival. And we've put that money aside for uh, the, um, for, again, for the, for the days or the times that the school's not able to support itself. But we successfully um, uh, generate enough funds to, for various improvements. And, and right now we've got about 65 kids in the school. And we're always looking for increasing the number of kids uh, in the school and provide additional services and facilities to the school. So Plans that's where for any other fundraisers this year? There are fundraisers. There are, uh, we've got a, a ladies' breakfast coming up. We've got a, a golf day, which is going to be coming up in the end of the year, September, October. And um, we've got a comedy evening, which will be in July. So those are the very small festival, or, excuse me, very small uh, events, but those are, uh, that build up on our community following and uh, they're very well supported as well. Now, if people want to attend these events and want to know more about the school, maybe where they can donate money sure. as well? Well, they can certainly get in touch with our PR department and all the contact details are on the Facebook. You might want to join the Facebook profile. Uh, we've got a, a website and uh, we can always hand out the contact telephone numbers and the website address uh, at another time or well, we'll certainly upload it to our Facebook account as well, and, so, uh, and people are we'll more than welcome it. to go check yes. out more if you want to donate anything to the Lazito School, who cares for the physically and mentally challenged in Johannesburg. Dear Linda, Sergio, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, back to you. Well, thank you very much, Katrina. Yes, a very good cause that is.
Sometimes when you have a little bit of fun at Lizita Land, you don't always know that uh, it's, uh, well, it all plays out in a very, very productive way for those suffering with cerebral palsy. Newsroom is broadcast live from our studios in Auckland Park, Johannesburg, you 9 and 10 a.m. every weekday morning. The show repeats at 2 in the afternoon, with then a rebroadcast at 5 a.m. the following morning. We also stream live on YouTube at that time, with our whole show then available on demand on our YouTube channel all of the time. This is SABC News. You have been watching Newsroom, where we love it in the morning.